And it was just the grace of Jesus. I felt his presence and I felt him leading me and I would pray and my prayers would get answered. And I didn't know any other Christians and so I didn't really have a church to go to. And then probably within a month or two, I found a church and slow, this is what I discovered in church. I began to be taught all the things that I had to do to get Jesus to do what he was already freely doing. And I realized that I was being ushered into a mindset of works. It was Jesus plus my behavior, Jesus plus my confession, Jesus plus my beliefs, Jesus plus, and Jesus plus anything, I'm telling you after 30 years, Jesus plus anything is bondage and religion in some form. And it's not what he had in mind uh, from the very beginning. So, so while I'm kind of going to give you my testimony from the word faith mindset. And I, listen, I have nothing wrong, nothing against uh, those people. I have many friends in that mindset, but that's just how I was raised. And there were basically, when I look back, there were two themes that were really harped on or pressed upon, two themes of the Bible. One was that Adam was given the authority of God. He was created in the image of God, and then he lost it, but then it was restored to him. And now he needs to take his authority. So we need to take our authority. Has anyone else heard that? So it all became about my authority. My, my, I was the one who had to keep out the devil. You know, I, I was a 19-year-old kid. Now all of a sudden I, I'm tasked with keeping out the devil. I've never even met him. That's a lot of responsibility, you know what I mean? Keep out the devil. Got a, uh, and, and that happens through my beliefs and through my confessions and what I do, my behavior. And so Adam's authority was a big one. And then another one was, and if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28 is the law of Moses. When Moses was giving the law to the children of Israel... And it was basically the introduction to the law, and it is a covenant that is based upon curses for disobedience and blessings for obedience. And so what I got into, it was all about being blessed. If God's hand is upon you, you're blessed. If his hand's not upon you, then you're cursed. And so you can begin to look at people and see, well, they're not being blessed, so they must be cursed by God. And so what, what does that breed? It doesn't breed reality, it breeds a bunch of Christians pretending to be something they're not so that they could fit in. And it, Jesus came to heal our hearts, not so that we can hide our hearts. And a lot of people have this mindset that they got to go through life hiding what's really in them. And I want to set you free this morning to realize this. God created you. Before the foundation of the world, he had your personality in mind. You think you're weird? You are weird. But that's okay, you were created that way. And until you become comfortable with who you are, no one else is going to be comfortable. And if you think God's not comfortable with it, and that comes from the thinking that God's upset. He just wants, he wants to save us. He loves you just the way that he is so that he can save you and turn you into something that you're not. It really doesn't make sense. Now, Deuteronomy 28 says, if you do this, then God will do that. Look at verse 1. And it shall come to pass if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all his commandments. Everyone say all. Now, this is one of the things that I noticed in the word faith mindset and in a lot of teaching in general. We begin to rewrite the word to make it fit our doctrine instead of just reading what it says. But Moses said, if you will keep all the commandments. He didn't say if you'll keep most. He didn't say if you keep 80%, you'll get 80% blessings. If you keep 50%, you get 50% blessings. He said, if you keep them all. One of the things we were never taught was that the law of Moses, first of all, here's where I'm, I'm, telling, here's where I'm going with my sermon this morning. It won't be long, but I'm saying, what I'm gonna, the point I'm trying to make is, I was introduced to the law of Moses as if it was doctrine for me as a Christian. Then I was set on this treadmill performance to try and keep the law of Moses, and then it took me 30 years to discover I was never under the law of Moses. <laughs> And so much teaching today that I see is not determining whether the law of Moses belongs in Christian doctrine or not. We simply argue over how much. We're measuring skirt lengths or saying country music shouldn't be uh, 
You can't be saved and sing country music, uh, which is not true. I mean, you have no taste if you sing country music, but you're still saved. The, tr the treadmill performance, and so I, I've been a pastor for 30 years in word, faith, mindset, and Greg told you a little bit. I, I took over a church. I wasn't a pastor of a church in Palm Springs for many years, and then I uh, took over a little church that was just starting, and, and I got it up to about 500 people with that word, faith, mindset, and then really got a hold of grace of God, and not really got a hold of it, but I really began to question all the things that I had been seeing, number one, and then the grace of Jesus was not something new. It always hearkened in my heart that, that this is the Jesus that I met at the very first day. This isn't some new doctrine. And, and the word faith mindset loves doctrines. They love the doctrine of healing, the doctrine of forgiveness, the doctrine of laying on of hands. We love doctrines because they're all things that you can do. And then you find, here's 10 steps to become a better husband. Here's eight principles on how to be a, a godly wife. And it's all things that we can do. And none of it is based upon the finished work of Jesus. It's based upon the law of Moses. If you do this, then God will do that. And we've taken the simple gospel of grace and the finished work of Jesus and combined it with the law of Moses, unfortunately, and have turned it into a mixed gospel that is devoid of life and will exhaust the most, the most hungry Christian in the world. Loves God. I mean, it's so dangerous to be a brand new Christian, hungry for Jesus, hungry for fellowship, hungry to do anything, and then you get into a situation where they will take advantage of that and take every penny you have and wear you out, volunteering you, and then when you're starting to complain, then they will uh, get rid of you and replace you with someone else because... The uh, end justifies the means, and it's all about saving the world. I realize that's not the heart of Jesus, and it's not the plan of God from the very beginning. I began to hear things like, the Bible is the handbook for life. Have any of you heard that? Well, when you think about, what, the, what does that mean? The Bible's the handbook for life. I have a handbook for my, uh, my RV. It tells me all the different things that's going on and how to fix it, but is that what this is? That's what I was taught, and that mindset got me thinking, and this is what I've seen, that people teach the Bible as if it's the Word of God that belongs to everybody, and everybody, uh, every part of it is for everybody. A few years ago, I began to read the Bible as if it was saying what it said, and I was amazed to learn what I learned, and I was set free in a way that I'm never going back into bondage again, and I relax in Jesus in a, in a way that is just was foreign to me before. Can you say amen? Now, here's what I found out. The Bible is a covenant. Actually, we have an old covenant and a new covenant. The old covenant was made with the nation of Israel. It was not made with Gentiles. From Genesis 1... Here's a new way to think of your Bible. From Genesis 1 to Genesis 12, it's about that much. That's the history of humanity before God raised up Abraham. When God raised up Abraham, he made a covenant with him, and, and it was a covenant of circumcision. And that covenant was, was uh, introduced to bring in the Messiah into the earth. Now, we find out from the Apostle Paul that Genesis 1 through 12 was the history of the the Gentiles, but what did God think about it? What was he thinking about Gentiles back then? In other words, do you think, because this is what I was kind of assuming, that everybody in the world was reading the Bible back then. Everyone thought they were supposed to obey it. But do you understand it was Jewish scriptures? No one even had access to it. The king of China was not obeying the Ten Commandments. And he was not in trouble with God for not doing so. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that God gave up on the Gentiles. He gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's what it says in Romans uh, chapter 1, so that he could have mercy upon them all. So he went to this guy named Abram, and he said, Abe, through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. That's where me and you come in. 
Then a few years later, he went to Abram and he said, now listen, I want to make an addendum to that covenant. I want to add the covenant of circumcision. Now this is a conditional covenant. That first co covenant, that all the families of the earth is unconditional, simply meaning God was the one who said, I'm going to do it. There were no conditions that anyone had to meet for that to happen. Abraham was going to be uh, the, the cause of blessing all the families in the world through God. That was a promise. But then God said, here's a covenant of circumcision. Now this one is different. Every male member must be circumcised, and if they're not, they're cut off from the covenant. So this is a conditional covenant, right? Then we go down through the years, and we have the law of Moses instituted in, and the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments is what the Bible calls the Old Covenant. Now, think about this. Well, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. Let's look at a few scriptures regarding the law. Romans chapter 9, look at verse 4. Who are, this is Paul talking about the Israelites, and he said, Who are the Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? And so we see that Paul is writing in the book of Romans and he's saying to the Jews, you were the ones who were given the law. Look at Romans chapter 3. Verse 19, it says this, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law. You know, another way of saying that is the law is not talking to those who are not under it. Paul said, we know that whatever the law is saying, it is saying to those who are under it. Now, for some reason, the Christian church has subsumed this covenant with Israel and said that it is ours, and now we're responsible to keep it. That is the bad doctrine that has creeped in at the very foundation that has caused so many problems in the lives of Christians, mine especially. The, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? I, when I was in school, I was taught that this is the standard for Christian behavior. Nothing could be a more twisted version of what the Sermon on the Mount is. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus preaching the law. Here's something, to, let me just throw this out and think about this. When Jesus came, he said, I am come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was a Jew, rabbi, born under law, fulfilled the law. Didn't he fulfill the law? When, are you guys here? All right, when he fulfilled the law, you cannot fulfill the law without keeping the law. And you cannot fulfill the law if you violate the law. So it's important to understand when Jesus came, he preached the law. He commanded his disciples to keep the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. But Jesus was a man who was under the law. He was a Jew. And when he sent his disciples out, he sent them only to the nation of Israel. Why is that? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. This is one of the scriptures that really got me thinking about how to begin to distance myself from this false mindset. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Now, Gentiles, when I, here's another thing. When I was in Bible school, they would take the word Gentiles and, and translate that into sinner. But Gentile is not a sinner. Gentile is someone that's not a Jew. And so they said anything that Jesus was talking about is for us Christians, and anything that's talking to the Gentiles is the sinners. No, anything that Jesus was talking about was to the Jews, and Gentiles were not under it. Listen to what it says in verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, 
who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Listen, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ. You are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. So what was God's viewpoint of Gentiles prior to Jesus? He had given up on them because he knew that he was going to have mercy upon them all. But from his perspective, they were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. They had no covenants. They were without hope, and they were without God. That's what God considered the Gentiles. Everyone that was not a Jew. Do you understand that from the Scripture? So why is that important? Because he was not expecting them to be keeping the law of Moses. The Gentiles' behavior wasn't being determined on their blessings whatsoever. And here's another, th so what does that lead to? The things that Jesus said, Jesus said many hard things that we tend to ignore, that, that are very confusing and, and hard to understand unless you understand this number one context. He was not speaking to everybody. He was talking to this one nation who had a covenant that they had agreed to with God. And within that covenant were blessings and curses based upon their behavior, which they had agreed to in advance. So Jesus was talking to them regarding their behavior, and he was very upfront with them about it. But to assume that whatever Jesus said regarding behavior applies to us brings in mass amounts of confusion. Do you realize that when the rich, rung, the rich young ruler, when he came to Jesus, he said, what, Jesus, what do I do to receive eternal life? You remember that story? This is what I noticed Jesus did not say. Just hang in there, bud. I'm going to the cross in a year or two, and it's all good. Jesus said, you know the commandments. What does the law say? Then he said, keep these, and you shall have eternal life. That's what Jesus told this guy. How do you get eternal life? You keep the law. That's what Jesus told this guy. But Jesus wasn't talking to a Gentile. He was talking to a Jew who had a covenant with God. Jesus would never have said that to a Gentile. He would have never said, keep the law to a Gentile. Here's another thing you might not realize. In the entire ministry of Jesus, there were only two Gentiles that he ministered to. Everybody that he talked to was a Jew. On the day of Pentecost, everyone they talked to was a Jew. This was a Jewish situation. This is where so much confusion comes in by putting ourselves into it and not understanding. Here's where I'm going. Years later, Paul brought in this, this gospel called the mystery. And Paul said of this mystery, it has been hidden in God until it was revealed to him. So we have Peter and the twelve and Jesus and John the Baptist preaching this gospel for years. And then Peter, or Paul comes up years later and says, I have one that has been hidden in God. Now that's very confusing unless you understand that Peter and the twelve were ministering only to the nation of Israel. They were confirming the promises made to the Father. In fact, look at Romans chapter 15 real quick. This will help you understand some of the things that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. In, John, or in Romans chapter 15 and verse Hey, this is what Paul said. He said, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So Jesus had a very particular ministry when he was here on earth the first time. He was confirming promises that were made to the fathers. That's why when Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, Well, just hold your place in Romans and turn to Acts chapter 3 real quick. When Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, listen to what he preached. He said, verse 17, And now, brethren, I know that you did it through ignorance. He was calling these Jews the murderers of their Messiah. But verse 18, he said, But those things which God has shown before by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, be so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins might be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, 
And he will send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Now notice this next phrase. It's really important. What Peter is preaching, he said, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So whatever Peter is preaching, he said, I'm preaching the same thing the prophets have been preaching since the world began. Now go back to Romans and look at Romans 16. And this is Paul, and this is years later. And this is Paul, what he had to say. He said in verse 25, or verse 24, he said, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Now unto him that is of power to establish you. Now notice what he says. According to my gospel. And here's one of the things I noticed, that Paul was the only one that called the gospel his gospel. He said, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to to the revelation of the mystery. Now what is he saying? Which has been kept secret since the world began. So I began to ask myself, if Peter is preaching something that everyone's known since the world began, and Paul is preaching something that has been hidden in God since the world began, how could they be the same? Does anyone else have a problem with that question? If we assume that the gospel is the gospel is the gospel. And herein lies the bondage for all Christians. Peter and the twelve were the gospel of the, they had the, the apostleship speaking to the circumcision. They were preaching to Jews. The doctrine that goes with the nation of Israel does not belong to the church. Look at Acts chapter 15. And then I'll get off this little hobby horse. But Acts chapter 15 was pivotal in my, my thinking. Look at, this is, this is Acts chapter 15. Here's the history of the Bible. In the beginning of Acts, Peter preached to Cornelius. He was the first Gentile that got saved. That was 10 years after the crucifixion. See, I'd always assumed that they were out preaching to Gentiles the day after the cross. Day after the cross, they quit keeping the Sabbath, and Sunday church started. And, they, and on the day of Pentecost, it was filled with Gentiles and Jews and everybody. And then Peter and the Twelve went out to all different nations. That's not historically what happened at all. We find that Peter preached only to Jews, and it's ten years after the cross. And when he gets to Cornelius' house, and he gets there by revelation of the Holy Ghost, when he gets there, he said, he said something that just blew me away. He said, Cornelius, you know that it is an unlawful thing for me, being a Jew, to come under the roof or have lunch with one from another nation. Now, to me, that, that made me throw my doctrine brakes on big time. Because that violated everything that I had been taught. How could it be possible that it's 10 years after the cross that Peter has never preached to a Gentile? Didn't Jesus tell him to go and preach the world to every preach the gospel to every creature? He'd never preached to a single Gentile. The one that got saved was by revelation of it was set up by the Holy Ghost through visions and angels. When Peter got there, he didn't even know what he was there for. First of all, he said, "You know, it's unlawful." So how was it, and why was it still unlawful for the apostle Peter, who hung with Jesus for three years? Why would he consider it unlawful to eat anything that wasn't kosher and unlawful to speak to someone who is not a Jew 10 years after the cross? Why? Because he was still keeping the law of Moses. Why? Because his mindset was still extending the kingdom to the nation of Israel. They had this period of time where they were going to accept or reject their king after the resurrection. But during that time, God knew in advance that they were going to reject, but he had to give them a bona fide offer. But he also knew he had this mystery hidden in his heart from the very beginning. And Paul wraps it all up in Romans 9, 10, 11. But the mystery was, see, according to prophecy, all Gentiles were going to come to God, but it was through the nation of Israel. That's why Peter and the twelve were out preaching to Israel, because they needed to get Israel saved first. After Israel gets saved, then the Gentiles will come to God through him, through them. Paul says it's, it was not through the rise of Israel that the blessings came on the Gentiles, but rather through the fall of Israel. And God has raised up this mystery. Now, here's the thing. When 
Peter showed up and talked to Cornelius. First of all, he had no clue, no clue why he was there, right? He wasn't there evangelizing. He was there being sent by the Holy Ghost, but he wasn't even sure. And then he started to figure out what was going on. And he said these two things, and this has really made an impression on my mind. He said, I perceive, this is the Apostle Peter, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, this is what Peter said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, him that fears God and does works of righteousness is accepted with him. And I thought with my lightning quick mind, didn't he already know that? And obviously he didn't. My point is, if he's talking to Cornelius on a Tuesday, and he says, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, that means on Monday, he perceived that God was a respecter of persons. So he was on a Jewish mission. Not understanding that has allowed the law of Moses to come into part of the doctrine for the Christian church. And so here's the thing. Part of the mindset of the kingdom gospel that Jesus preached was the establishment of the Jewish kingdom with all the hierarchy and with the temples and the censers and the smoke, right? When Paul came with the mystery gospel, that was for the Gentiles, and that's where church history should have headed off, where we're taking the gospel of reconciliation and inviting sinners but instead, we took this mindset that we are continuing the ministry of Peter, and we've got to build the kingdom. So when you build kingdoms, you need castles, and you need kings, and you need hierarchy, and you need a lot of money. And then you need to discipline people who are getting in your way, and then you need to take cities for God, and then you need to go out and build all this stuff, and you think you're doing all this stuff for God. And none of it is amounting to a hill of beans other than wearing out people and getting them uh, messed up in your particular brand of works righteousness. That's a long way of saying that in Acts chapter 15, look at this. Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. Certain men, now this is Acts chapter 15. I'm not sure how many years after the cross, but in Acts chapter 10, that was 10 years when Cornelius got saved. So this is after that. Certain men which came down from Judea, they taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now these people are Jewish Christians who are keeping the law of Moses. Now, of course they are. Because when they became Christians, they only thought that Jesus was the king. Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Jewish Messiah. But he didn't, none of them thought that he was starting a new religion or phasing out Judaism whatsoever. They thought this was the answer to all the promises. Here is the king. So they considered themselves Jews. And so here are circumcised guys who know, according to the prophecy, Gentiles come in through God by Moses. And they, so they said, you cannot, unless you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so they got this big argument about it. And they had to think back to when Peter got the first Gentiles saved. And then after this big argument, they came to this conclusion. Look at verse 24. For as much as we have heard, this is James, the uh, pastor of Jerusalem and Jesus' brother, half-brother. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. And that's what happens when you insert the law into a place it's not supposed to be. You subvert people's soul because when I first became a Christian I knew nothing but joy and forgiveness of Jesus and within a year I was exhausted and down on myself and not happy about where I was as a Christian anyone else can relate to that they used to tell me man you're when you first become a Christian the reason that your prayers are all getting answered is because because God knows you're a baby and he wants to encourage you Let me just tell you in advance, that's, that's a load of BS. The reason my prayers were getting, this is what I discovered later. The reason my prayers were so getting answered is because I never approached Jesus ever back then. I had no concept that I was worthy of anything. Everything I looked to Jesus, I was just so excited for him, and I knew how awesome he was. So whenever I prayed, my receiving was based on how awesome Jesus was, not how much I deserved it. 
We can all relate with that because we know that's true in our heart. But when you get into a system where they're teaching works, whether you want to believe it or not, it gets, it gets on you. Peer pressure and all this stuff, and they start parading all the people that are blessed because they gave, right? So if you want to be blessed, you need to give. You need to do this. And so we turned, even the, the joy of giving, which uh, uh, giving was stolen from me when I was a new Christian. I loved giving, I loved blessing, but then it was turned into a work. This is how God, this is God's plan for you to prosper. It's not about you starting a business and making good income, it's about you sowing your way to prosperity, and so you sow, and then they started saying things like, if you will let go of what's in your hand, then God will let go of what's in his hand. Has anyone heard that? Yeah, you could take that straight out of Deuteronomy 28. If you, then God. If you, then God. I don't care what you, but if you bless, if you do good, then God will do good. If you do bad, then God will do bad. And so I was such in bondage with, with all these ideas that I had opened up the door to the devil. Let me, let me just tell you, as a, as a man and a Christian and a believer, I haven't thought about the devil in years. I used to spend hours fighting him. I'm sure he didn't even know I was there. I used to spend so much of my time screaming at the devil in tongues. And when I was in Palm Springs, man, we'd take the tram up to the mountain and, you know, decree a decree. It is so silly how we have put this authority bondage on people. You get up and you decree a decree. You know, we can't even clean our closet out, but we're decreeing things over the devil and eternity. It's just so much responsibility. I haven't, the reason I haven't thought about the devil in years is because I've come to realize I serve a Savior who defeated him. If I keep my, my, my eyes and my mind off G, on Jesus, I don't even have to worry about the devil. Now, they used to say, if you don't know your enemy, he'll eat your lunch. You've got to know, you've got to. And so people would, back in those days, man, we'd get on an airplane and they'd lay hands on the plane before they get in it and start confessing and all the brakes are going to work and the pilot's going to... That is a ton of responsibility, number one. Number two, I don't care how many things, if you confess 300 things, you've missed 300 more at least. That's why there's no rest in that mindset. That's why you can never relax in Jesus because you are never done. When it's up to you, you're never done. Right? Right? If you're a parent, you know that. If you're a single parent, you really know that. If it's up to you, you're never done. So how are you going to relax and enjoy? You're not. You're just going to try and tread water and keep your head above. And that's how the joy of giving and the joy of Christianity was sucked out of my heart. And so over 25 years, I, like I said, I took that church in that word-faith mindset. And when you're teaching principles and steps, people love that because it's things that you can do. But then when I got a hold of grace and begin to preach grace, religious people don't like grace. I, I was in denial for years about that because I can't imagine anyone not liking grace. But religious people don't like grace because it disqualifies your actions. Your actions aren't the basis for your blessings. If you're a competitive person or type A or you're used to getting things done, you don't want to be waiting on anybody, not even God. And you want to get blessed for your actions and, and for your stuff. And then when you're not blessed, then you're ticked. Remember in Bible school, they used to say, and they told me when I first got there, because really, I, I had no Christian doctrine at all, and they said, if you will give 10% of your income to God faithfully, if you will do that, then he will open up the windows of heaven, and he'll pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain. So I did that for about three years, and then I, I, I approached God, and I said, listen, I know they told me if I gave 10%, you'd open the windows and pour out a blessing on me I can't contain. But here's, here's a deal that I'll make with you. Why don't you just give me back what I put in and we'll call it even? <laughs> There's a lot of denial that goes on in that men mindset. And the reason that there's a lot of denial is because everyone's hopes are based on illusions. And you can't be the, the little boy that's, that's telling the emperor that he has no clothes because you're going to be pulled out and jerked out as a rebellion. 
It's pretty sad that when you're in a church, you are, if you ask questions, you're considered rebellious. Why is that? Because no one wants to answer those questions you're asking. And you are rebellious to that system. And I realize there is a system that is not of God, and it wears out people. So, look at verse 24 in Acts chapter 15. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall tell you the same things by mouth. For Now look at verse 28. This is so important. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you. Now who's he talking to? The Gentiles that are receiving Jesus. This is what is for the Gentiles. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon the Gentiles no greater burden than these necessary things. Number one, you abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you do, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare ye well. Now I want you to underline that in your Bible so you can go back to it. Every time the law is creeping up in your heart. When you think that you're not blessed because you haven't been tithing or you haven't been doing uh, the Sermon on the Mount correctly or whatever, you need to understand that they came to the conclusion that regarding the Gentiles, they are not under the law of Moses, not one jot, not one tittle. So I ask you a question. How is it that the Sermon on the Mount is considered doctrine for Christians when in Acts 15, they came to the conclusion that it's not. And to be honest with you, I was just flabbergasted after 30 years of realizing we, are, we have the law of Moses so mixed into our doctrine, and from the very beginning, it was not so. No wonder we're crazy. No wonder we're confused because the foundation that we have started off with has been incorrect from the very beginning. Remember, Paul, Peter said, those that fear God and do works of righteousness. That is the mindset. Fear God, do works of righteousness. What did Paul say the mystery was? That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So this mystery gospel, God's not waiting for people to fear him, and he's not waiting for people to do works of righteousness before they accept Jesus. The mystery gospel is based upon the life of Jesus Christ being offered to human beings, to being offered to the Gentiles. It's got nothing to do with the law of Moses. Now, if you'll begin to go through your heart and your mind and checklist of all the doctrines, of all the things that you think you have to do, if you don't realize that most of them come right out of the early books or the Gospels, or what would, you, or what would Jesus do? That's the big thing. What would Jesus do? With that in mind, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What would Jesus do? Because we have turned the gospel into Jesus was a, a good prophet and he had good things to say and he loved on people, so let's find out what he did and let's go do the same. When I, and I found this out in chapter 5 regarding Paul's mystery. This really shocked me, this verse right here. Verse 16, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. This is Paul speaking. He said, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, or from now on, we don't even know him anymore after the flesh. That verse, that verse tweaked me for a long time until I realized what it was talking about and in the context. It said, we used to know Jesus after the flesh. The flesh that in the context, he's talking about Adam, the first Adam. And when Jesus came, he came as Adam. He came as a representative of the Adam. In fact, Romans chapter 5 says that Adam was a type of Christ. The ministry that Jesus did on earth was fulfilling the role 
of Adam. But when he died and raised from the dead, it was not Jesus, the old Jesus being raised from the dead. It was a new creation, one that had never existed before. Now, look what it says regarding this gospel that we're called to preach. It was so exciting. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be... And listen, here's what got me thinking. When, when you read Peter, James, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's all about the earthly ministry of Jesus. Paul, who brought the mystery gospel to the Gentiles, he only mentions the, the earthly ministry of Jesus two times. If it was not for the apostles, if you took out the epistles of Paul, we would be clueless. We would be absolutely clueless to what the gospel of grace is. He's the one that told us what happened from the cross to the throne. He's the one that told us the, the, the new creation realities. He's the one that told us that he, Jesus was the last Adam and the head of the new creation. Now, here's the thing. So much teaching today is about remodeling Adam. What I mean by that is so much of what I heard was, here's eight principles on how to be a better parent. Here's six steps to be a better boss or businessman. It's all taking who you are, adding some wisdom from Jesus, and making you a better you. We present that as the gospel. That's nothing to do with the gospel. But it sets us on this treadmill of performance and doing things, trying to get God to bless us. And we're off on the wrong start from the very beginning. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You know, I always taught and I always thought, because I was taught. That, that means I accepted Jesus and now I'm a new creation today. Yesterday I wasn't, today I accepted Jesus, I'm a new creation. That is true, but that's not what this is saying. He's saying, if any man be in Christ, he is part of the, the new creation. As opposed to the old creation. The old creation is Adam and everything that represents. The new creation is Christ and Him crucified. And He is the new man. Everything that Adam provided, you are free from. Now you are in Christ. But here's the thing. There, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is part of this new creation. Old things are passed away. That's what we don't want to admit. Old things are passed away. That means you in Adam is gone. That's what we're not presenting as the gospel. We're presenting the gospel as, here, add Jesus to your life. Add some religion. Add some grace. Add some faith. Add this to your life. But that's not what the, that's not what the gospel offer is. The gospel offer has nothing to do with heaven and hell. It's got nothing to do with right or wrong. We have picked that up from the law of Moses, and if you do this, I will do that. See, but Paul said this, from Adam until Moses, talking about the Gentiles and all humanity, from Adam until Moses, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, that next verse, nevertheless, death reigned. So the problem was never, are you right? Or are you wrong? The problem is, are you alive or are you dead? Now, when we present the gospel like that, then it, then it gets it down to its brass tacks. I am dead. Do I want life? The only way I can get that life is to get Jesus. But here's the thing. If I get that life, it's his life, not mine. It's not my life fixed up. It's his life. It's not my faith reinforced. It's his faith. It's not my love trying to be perfected. It's his love. It's Jesus living his life through me. That's the offer of the gospel. The offer that we're proposing is, if you accept Jesus and if you'll do these principles in the word, you can become more like him. That's what would Jesus do. I'm interested in what Jesus did. And what he did was, became the last Adam. Took all the sin of mankind paid the price, was raised from the dead, totally 100% the righteousness of God. And if you are in him, look, look at the rest of this um, phrase. Verse 19, 
to wit, this is the ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. You see how useless it is to stand on a street corner with, with picketing signs. You see how useless it is to, as the church, try to force non-believers to act right. Who cares? I, I'll tell you who cares. People that have the mindset that this nation is a godly nation, that we have a covenant with God, and that unbelievers are ticking off God, and he's causing judgment to come. And if we can just get rid of these freaking unbelievers, then we'd get our good old traditional family values back. We can, you know, we can have Aunt B at church, and we can get Andy Taylor to be our sheriff instead of the SWAT team. And, But all that does, that's not the gospel. That's the opposite of the gospel. The gospel is to extend the grace of Jesus, not to fix sinners. And so when, when we turn it into, you, uh, this is our righteous nation, and you're messing it up, all you're doing is making the church against the world. It's supposed to be the church serving the world. By doing what? By extending to them that invitation and the only invitation from Jesus, which is life. Free life. It's yours. It doesn't. You don't earn it. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It's all for free. But here's the thing. If you want that life, you've got to make this choice. You cannot hang on to Adam and receive Jesus. That's why so many of us are, are on this performance treadmill. We think that we're taking Jesus, but we're trying to fix ourselves up. To get Jesus and his life, You've got to let go of yourself. And that absolutely comes against everything that we're taught. We're taught to man up, man. Fake it till you make it. Don't rely on anybody. You can do it. Don't, let them, don't ever let them see you sweat, right? Why? Because we're Americans and we can handle this. Well, all that happens is you end up with fake people, faking each other out, smiling until they're exhausted and dead as a doornail on the inside. When I, may, I meet people all the time, I ask them how they're doing, oh, too blessed to be stressed. What, what I hear is, I'm too scared to be honest. And you don't have to be too scared. You have to be scared if you're thinking that God is judging you or, or blessing you based upon your behavior. But you don't have to be when you realize it's all about Him. Look at verse 21 of this chapter. For he, speaking God the Father, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you want to know how righteous God sees you? However righteous Jesus is. There is no 80% righteousness. There's no 70% righteousness because you've only been 70% good. Your righteousness has nothing to do with the righteousness of Jesus, and your works, good works or bad works, cannot violate, number one, or alter the work of Jesus. The sooner you get rid of that mindset, the sooner you'll give up on yourself and accept him. See, we're taught to be tough, but Paul said, when, when he was being persecuted, he said, I went to the Lord three times. I said, Lord, you've got to take this away. And God said, my grace, I want to say grace. Say grace with me. Grace. My grace is sufficient. Now, I, I, I've heard that sermonized through religious eyes, and they say, well, what God said was, Paul asked God to take this away, and God said, no. But that's not what God said at all. God said, my grace is sufficient for the situation. And I have come to realize that his grace is sufficient for every situation. But Paul said, he came to this conclusion. I will therefore glory in my weaknesses. So if you're, if you're not experiencing grace, let me just throw this out. The Bible says that he gives, God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. You can't get grace by being proud. 
That's pretty funky. In other words, you've got to humble yourself before God. What does that mean? That means just getting honest. I used to fear that because I was told that God was so mean, but I, what I have discovered, the hard way, I've got to admit, I went through crash after crash after crash. Uh, you know, I've been bankrupt. I've been divorced. I went through a lot of crap with my church. When I began to preach grace, the religious people fought me on it, and we went from 500 down to a, about 50, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm glad, number one, but I was constantly faced with the choice, do I change what I teach to keep people? You know, that's a real choice when you got bills to pay, and, but it wasn't really ever a choice. I just knew it was never going to be worth it. But I, this is something I discovered. Religious people want to be proud of what they do. do. They want to be proud of what they've given. They want to be recognized for what they're confessing. They want to believe that they are the ones in charge. It's a whole different thing. To, but here's what I discovered. All those things that I feared were going to happen when I crashed. You know, if I got divorced, if I went bankrupt, if I lost a church, if I did all this stuff, God would, you know, hightail it out and never speak to me again. What I found by fa a fact was every situation of crash that I went through, Jesus was the first one there, never left, never condemned me, never met, made me feel like I was less than. He always took me by the hand and walked me through the situation, always trying to bless me and help me. So I was, it was dawning on me that all the stuff I've been told is not true. Not only that, I was finally, for the first time in my life, getting honest with my heart. That's a safe place to be. You, you know, here's the thing, and, I, and I'm close with this thought. You know that if you receive Jesus, you're safe in him. Your eternity is tied up. Wherever he is, that's where you're going when you die. You never have to think about heaven or hell or give that another thought in your life. But what you can do is begin to be honest enough with your own heart and with your own self to let God honestly begin to heal those things that you've been hiding. The church won't, your peers won't, people won't let you be who you really are because you're scared of how they're going to react. You can trust God. You can come to Him to obtain mercy and grace in the time of need. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And that will freaking change your life. When you realize all the fears that you had of all the things that were going to happen, when you fell apart, didn't, then you realize, wait a minute. Maybe I can trust this guy that I met on day one. Amen? And let me just I'll close with this. In John chapter 15, Jesus said uh, to abide in Him. Abide in him. He said, well, let's look at that because I can't remember it offhand. John chapter 15. Look at verse 4. Abide in me, this is Jesus speaking. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. Now notice what Jesus said. I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. When I went to school, they took that passage and that, that mindset and said, now your responsibility is to go out and bring in fruit for God. You're supposed to be constantly be doing things to build the kingdom. Your fruit should be evident to all men. But that's not what Jesus was saying at all. He was never saying. Well, what, what did he say? Let's just think about it. He said, I am the vine and you are the branch. Now just think of how a tree works, an apple tree. An apple tree the branch will hold or will bear the apples. But the branch has no responsibility, neither any ability, to produce the apple. Just think about what I'm saying. You are the branch. You are created to display fruit. But you're not created to produce fruit. You're created to bear the fruit 
that Jesus produces through you. Now, that takes all the responsibility off of you. What is your job now as a branch? Jesus said, your job is to abide in me. Now, if we, this is what I've come to realize, and I'm closing with this. I come to realize that my only job is to abide in Jesus. If I abide in Jesus, I will be safe. I will be good. Everything's going to work out. When I was in that word, uh, that confession mindset, it was all about me having the authority, then it was me constantly having to produce fruit, number one. And number two, when you get around all your friends and they're all showing off their fruit and you're in a season of dormancy, the temptation is almost too great. And we go down to big lots and we buy a bunch of plastic fruit and we start stapling it on our branches so that we look like we're alive because we've been taught to fear dormancy or fear the dark times or fear what... That is a natural part of life. You're not supposed to be always in production or always in bloom. There are dark times in life and they're nothing to be scared of or ashamed of. It's part of the natural part of life. But if you are in this mindset that you are blessed in proportion to what you are doing for God, then you'll constantly have to be doing. And if you are thinking that others will only think you're blessed compared to how you look, then you start acting fake. Are you all here? Like these. Are these real? These are fake. See, I look much more alive right now. If, if I'm a tree and I got green, I look much more alive. But the, but the fact remains that I am still as dead as I ever was. All I'm doing is faking out you and me, and I'm trying to fake out God. But the bottom line is I'm wasting time, totally, trying to impress people who don't really care, and they're going to be gone as soon as things get tough. The bottom line is you are safe in Him. You were created as you are. Don't be afraid of your personality. Don't be afraid of who you are and the hurts and the things that you have in your heart. You don't have to be ashamed of. In fact, the only answer that you really have is Jesus walking you through those a step at a time, healing them as he goes. If you'll learn that, man, you'll stay off the performance treadmill and you begin to enjoy your life in Jesus like never before. Can you say amen? Amen.